and it is my great pleasure to welcome you all back to another of the Military Aviation Museum's webinars. So, um, I'm Keegan Chetwin, Director of the Military Aviation Museum. So, tonight's format's going to be a little bit different. Uh, it's going to be more conversational than we have done these in the past, and that's because our guest tonight is an old friend of mine, Kermit Weeks. Kermit, how are you doing? Hey, Keegan, thanks for inviting me. So what we're going to do this evening is Kermit's going to take us through um, his his very special collection of aircraft, not totally dissimilar to ours, but uh, one of which is a Sunderland flying boat. But before we get into that, Kermit, would you maybe talk to us a little bit about your vision that is fantasy of flight? Oh, my gosh. Well, man, I don't know how far back you want to go, but I started in Miami uh, with what I call Act One, which was the Weeks Air Museum. We opened in 1985. And uh, it soon became apparent that I needed a bigger place. Uh, being on an airport wasn't that uh, uh, productive to get a lot of traffic, and I was in a lease situation. So I came to Central Florida uh, to start Fantasy of Flight to kind of control my own destiny. Um, built uh, uh, two runways. I've got lake access to fly vintage seaplanes. And, uh, you know, we opened in 1995. Uh, we closed uh, what I call Act Two in 2014, uh, you know, like six years ago, and I'm working on what I call Act Three. Um, I realized it's tough in the museum quote unquote business that, uh, you know, without grant subsidies, donations, volunteers to really make it pay for itself. And I really kind of was disillusioned with that whole concept and product. I'm in the Central Florida tourism area. I'm competing with a lot of uh, big distractions. And over time, I came to learn why I was led here and what I was supposed to create. So what I'm telling everybody is uh, Act 3 is about to begin. Please go take a bathroom uh, break and get a Coke and a hot dog because uh, hang loose. We're going to get started one of these days on Act 3. So that's what I'm working on right now. Kermit, you, uh, you believe that there's a kind of an interesting way that these airplanes affect people who visit museums, visit attractions, and and experience them flying. Can you talk to us a little bit about how flying and inspiration interconnect? Well, it's interesting. Um, fantasy of flight in the long run really has nothing to do with airplanes. Um, what I realize, I've always had a fascination with both physical flight, and there's plenty about me on the internet about, you know, flying competition aerobatics and all that kind of stuff, collecting a lot of airplanes and flying and restoring airplanes. But I've also had a fascination with what I would call inner flight. Uh, I won't get too much into my woo-woo side, but uh, basically uh, I've had the opportunity to have experiences beyond this five sense reality. And what happened was when I finally moved to Central Florida and I realized within two years, the people weren't coming that I was told were gonna come, I became a little bit disillusioned, and over time, really about a 10 to 15 year period, I began to understand what I was here to create. And it's really not about airplanes, history, and how an airplane flies. It's about the metaphor of what flight symbolizes to everyone. Because there's a limited number, forgive me for a lot of people listening out there, of anal aviation enthusiasts, but there's a very big world out there you could touch if you delivered a concept in a very different way than is being delivered. I am so over and done with the museum business, uh, but basically what I realized was what Fantasy of Flight about was, was basically taking my fascination with outer flight combining it with inner flight because they never had anything to do with each other. And I began to realize it was really what I'm trying to create. It's about flight of the human spirit. So it uses flight as a metaphor because you, I defy you to come up with a more profound metaphor for pushing our boundaries, reaching beyond ourselves and freedom than flight. You cannot because in the physical, everyone can relate to reaching for the sky, reaching for the stars. That has nothing to do with airplanes. And within us, we each soar in our imagination and we fly in our dreams. That has nothing to do with airplanes. So where Fantasy Flight's going with Act 3 is, we're going to still have airplanes. We're still going to deliver, uh, you know, a little history there, but in a completely different way. What we're going to do is we're going to use timeless stories of the human experience, not about aviation, timeless stories of the human experience that will 
garner from aviation stories that are inspiring. And, you know, theoretically, you potentially see an experience of somebody like a Lindbergh or a Glenn Curtis or a Jimmy Doolittle or somebody like that. You see something that they experienced that's common to your life. And the way we deliver it, you cannot not reflect on where you've come from, where you currently are, and where you dream to go. And so it's really more about, and, and as a parallel uh, to the existing industry around me, it's not a parallel because I'm gonna be a complete opposite. And basically the, the, the industry around me, you know, the big boys and all the little attractions, they basically use entertainment as an end product. And what I hope to do is use entertainment as a means to an end, still gonna be fun, still gonna have characters, developing my own characters, still gonna have great theming, great ride technology, immersive environments like the big boys, but instead of entertainment being an end product, it becomes a means to an end for your own self-discovery and self-transformation. You're gonna walk in my park one person, I'm not gonna tell you anything, you're gonna change yourself inside, leave a different person, nobody is gonna know what went on inside, and if I can deliver that, I think I'm on to something. Kermit, I think we're all eager to come visit a facility such as you described. Um, you have kind of a, an interesting collection with many, many rare and unusual airplanes in it, uh, not least of which is the Sunderland, but you've also got other flying boats represented in your collection. Um, you want to talk to us a little bit about uh, some of your Sikorskys? Yeah, um, I mean, I've got the, the first one I ever collected was a Grumman Duck. And uh, I'm actually the biggest owner since the U.S. Navy of World War II. I've had four. I'm down to two. Uh, but the two Sikorskys on the screen there were uh, flown by Martin and Osa Johnson. Uh, they had some factory pilots initially, but they took they shipped them down to Cape Town. They were like the original uh, adventure photographers, chronology. They did films. They would come back from their expeditions and show them, you know, where these were still unexplored lands and worlds, and people were fascinated by it. And uh, they're the only two current flying Sikorskys are painted in the colors of the S-38 on the left and the S-39 on the right. And I happen to own both of them. <laughs> Certainly an interesting story. Kermit, you have a special connection to your Sikorsky S-43. Uh, I've just put a picture up on the screen there for everyone. Can you tell us a little bit about what your connection to this specific airframe is? Well, it's interesting, without going too far off the chart on my woo-woo side, um, let's just say I have a connection with Howard Hughes. And he basically, uh, you know, he actually helped me get this airplane. And um, it was a fascinating story, but uh, at some point I wanna, we didn't, this is the one I acquired it. the engines were on the ground. This was the day I think that I basically, you know, had cut the deal and went there to look at it. And we decided there was some hull corrosion and things like that. It was a south of Houston and a hangar. And basically, you know, instead of flying at home and risking it, because I hadn't flown in seven years and ripping it apart, I, I'm so packed with airplanes right now in my limited space. I thought, you know, let's just take it apart there, restore the airplane to honor Howard in the way that the airplane was the last time Howard flew it which is not this paint job, by the way. And uh, so, you know, so it's in storage right now. And when, uh, uh, you know, Fantasy of Flight really kind of gets going and some certain things happen and this coronavirus thing kind of dies down, you know, that's going to be one of my priorities to get that airplane flying. It's, I mean, what, there's only three on the planet. And the other two are actually JRSs, which were, uh, you know, the military version. And this particular one, Howard, of course, Howard had to do everything special. He originally bought this in 1939 to fly around the world, and which he eventually did in the Lockheed 14. This is the only Sikorsky that has completely flush rivets on it. So pretty cool. This ship photo, by the way, was shot by Paul Bowen, I believe. Oh, no, uh, Phil McKenna, I'm sorry, one of them. <laughs> it's a great photo. Um, Kermit, Owning and operating your own flying boats, and especially true flying boats that aren't amphibians, is really rare these days. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about some of the complexities of owning a true flying boat? Your, uh, your, your Sunderland, it doesn't have wheels that retract up and stow. It really does need to land and operate from water. 
Yeah, absolutely. And what you're seeing there in the picture where the wheels are, that's what they call beaching gear. And in the form that it's in right there, uh, we took off, there's some flotation that fits on the outside of the deal because that obviously that won't float. The wheels will actually float because they have air in them, but we have to add some flotation to the, the vertical part there uh, so it'll float in the water because obviously we take it down to the lake, we put it in the water with the beach gear, taxi it in, and then you go out there and there's a little uh, block and tackle and you, you basically lower this thing, it disconnects with three pins and then you float them back into the shore and, you know, take them back with a tractor or a forklift or something, you know, but then once it's in the water, it is a pure flying boat. So <laughs> we often talk about how we keep airplanes airworthy. Um, how do you keep one seaworthy as well, Carmen? Well, if it leaks, you got to fix it. <laughs> you know, um, we did we did some hull work on it. Of course, when I purchased the airplane, it was in southern England, uh, basically at a place called Calshot at the head of the uh, Solent River there and uh, kind of by the Isle of Wight. And uh, we did, uh, you know, we had some work done on it on the hull and, uh, you know, check for leaks and blah, blah, blah. And of course, you know, the airplane on the inside, we've got uh, float switches, we've got to have batteries. You got to realize when this thing sits in the water, during the war, somebody lived on those things 24 seven. That doesn't happen here. And when I landed this thing and, you know, we had it in different places, uh, uh, you know, I had it on my lake here because my seaplane ramp wasn't done. I left it at Oshkosh for a year. We flew it over to Oshkosh and made the show in uh, 1994 and uh, left it there a year. We pulled it out on the land, came back the next year, put it in the water. And by that time, I needed to bring it home, but I still hadn't gotten my seaplane ramp permit and had it built yet. So when I landed it here in Florida, it sat in the water for a year. Well, let me tell you, Owning a flying boat that sits out in the water is like leaving a baby in a forest of wild animals. You got people trying to break in. You got you got hurricane problems. You got is it going to leak? Are the batteries still charged? Do the float switches all work? I mean, having a flying boat sitting in the water for any length of time is not you know <laughs> is not uh, is is not a comfortable situation. Prior to you, though, it really did operate pretty much consistently out of water. You're the uh, owner who's kept it indoors and out of the water longest of any of them, are you not? Well, I am. Well, when Edward Halton owned the airplane, which was before me, uh, if if well, the airplane came over. It was flown in, you know, Australia, then New Zealand. Eventually, came over. Charlie Charlie Blair had it in the Caribbean for a little while. But if it's being operated all the time. Being in the water is one thing, but if you but if you're not going to operate it all the time, uh, eventually, you know, like in the winter time when Edward Halton had it in England, he'd pull it out of the water and, and stick it in storage. So any of the shots you see in the water was when they were, you know, operating it on a reasonably reasonable, uh, believe uh, you know, regular basis. Okay. You have a lake on the property specifically to operate flying boats, and did that lake? You purchased the property because it had the lake, or at least partially because the lake was there, correct? Yeah, partially. It was interesting. When I when I was actually, I saw this property before the Weeks Air Museum ever opened in 1985. I continued to look in Central Florida, eventually buying not just this. It was three pieces I had to put together. And there was, I, I just had this sense, this feeling, there was three things that I needed to look for. One was great tourist access. I'm on an interstate halfway between Tampa and Orlando. I'm 25 minutes down the road from Walt Disney World. Okay. The next thing was, so I had good tourist access. I needed at least enough land for a 5,000 foot runway to fly in P-51s and bombers and stuff like that, which I, which I just have. And, and the third thing was key to, to, to the Sunderland and some of my other flights. I wanted lake access to be able to fly vintage airplanes in their natural environment. And I can't think of a museum anywhere that has seaplanes in their natural environment. I, I don't, you know, they're inside, they don't fly. And so part of my future dream for fantasy of flight, it won't be part of act three, but it'll be part of act three, part two, we're going to build a recreation of like a Pan Am clipper base and all my flying boats are going to be bent down on a lake in a Art Deco themed, really cool period environment uh, place. 
Well, that I think there's some of us who really, really want to see. Um, Kermit, this is an image of your Sunderland being put in the water. Can you talk to us a little bit about how the beaching gear actually works and how you maneuver this large and somewhat cumbersome airplane down into the water and get it prepared for flight? Right. Well, as you can see, there's a tractor in the back there, okay? And there's basically, there's a hook on the front, which is the mooring hook where you hook to the buoy when it's in the water. And what we would have done here is we would have used the tractor, which is our mowing tractor. We would have towed it from the hangar you saw it in before. And we basically would have towed it down the runway, nose first, down to uh, not the position it's in, but up to about where that little yellow uh, bulldozer is, okay? Then there's, a, there's basically a hook in the back, which is like a glider release hook, okay? And, uh, and what we would have done is the beaching gear, once it's on, all it does is roll. There's three pins that roll. And so what happens is we basically, um, it, the airplane prior to this would have been sitting up where the yellow bulldozer was, okay? And what we would have done is we would have hooked that bulldozer up to the back end with a strap. You can see the strap at the back there. And as you can see, I've since started the outboard engines, number one and four. OK, so what happens is, is I'm in the cockpit, the flight engineer is looking out the top to make sure everything's OK. And so what I'm doing at some point, I'm going to slowly start adding the throttles or the or the we've got chocks in it. So the bull, we're going to pull the chocks. I'm going to start moving the airplane slowly down the ramp while the bulldozer in the back is going to kind of hold me back. Once I start rolling, I just go back to idle. And what will happen is right about this point when the wheels hit the water line, somebody tells me because I can't see, okay, I'm looking ahead. And as soon as it hits the water line, um, uh, somebody waves to the guy in the bulldozer. He uh, goes forward quickly to slacken the line. And I effectively have like a glider release on the hook in the cockpit where I release that strap in the back. So basically now I control the airplane and I'm basically taxing it around, steering it with the outboard engines. There's no brakes, there's no rudder, and uh, you know, uh, of course it goes a little bit slower with the beaching gear on. And then what we'll do is, uh, at, but at this point, uh, this is coming out of the water, I think. No, no, wait a second, no, it's going into the water, but I'm not seeing where the, where the flotation is on the beaching gear, but there would have been some flotation there somewhere, or or maybe we added it once we got, I think that's what we did. We added it when we got out there and we strapped a bunch of five gallon cans on there. That, that's why it's not on there now. Okay, you've been quoted as saying the Sunderland is perhaps the largest uh, four engine flying boat that it's practical to own. Um, I think you know what's coming next, Kermit. Talk to yeah. us about the Hawaii Mars. Oh, my God. Well, let me tell you, man. Everybody says, oh, Kermit, go get the, the Hawaiian Mars, blah, blah, blah. Well, let me tell you, when I designed my biggest hangar, which is 200 feet wide, and I had to, the top of the, I designed it, the top of my hangar doors uh, were designed for the top of the propellers for the Sunderland. So my hangar doors are 25, 24 feet high. And there's actually a cutout in the middle of the hangar that has a roll-up door so I can get the tail in the hangar, okay? Well, it fits in there and I can put a DC-3 and a bunch of other airplanes in there and stuff. The Martin Mars is like stupid. The only way that airplane can operate is either being by paid the, by the US Navy or the Canadian Forestry Service, which is what's paying for this one, okay? And I mean, it's got uh, 3350s on it. I, to build, if they gave me the airplane, it would cost me $4 million to build a hangar for it. The Sunderland is a, what I say is the only practical four engine flying boat. It has a 112 foot wingspan, okay? The Mars is 200 feet. It's almost twice as big as the Sunderland in the wingspan. The, the, the span of the horizontal stabilizer is like 60 feet. I mean, the span is almost like 15 feet less than a PBY wingspan. And the top of the vertical fin of the Martin Mars on the beaching gear would stick out the peak of the roof of my hangar 15 feet. So, I mean, it's just, 
I, I, man, I, I hope one can end up somewhere. You know, the U.S. Navy needs to get one, but they don't have the money to build a hangar. And it sure doesn't make sense to have a Martin Mars sitting outside the Pensacola Museum in Florida here, U.S. Navy Museum, with a hurricane coming through, because it would end up in their front porch. So you actually got to fly this one. You you took it to Oshkosh, if I remember correctly. What was it like to to manhandle an airplane of this size around? Oh my God. Well, I mean, I I, I hope most of your uh, your followers here, you know, know that I have a YouTube channel. I got a lot of YouTube videos. Just go to Kermit Weeks YouTube. Uh, there's one of uh, the uh, flying at the, uh, you know, the uh, Oshkosh, and uh, there's some, you know, crawling through it, giving some, you know, tours of what's happening and stuff. And it was interesting. Wayne Colson, who owns, uh, you know, Colson uh, Flying Service, uh, that that had run this for the, you know, the Forestry Service fighting fires, uh, he basically was asked by the EAA to bring it there. And you know, what I had always mentioned to somebody. Uh, that, you know, hey, if you ever take it to Oshkosh, I'll pay for the fuel. And so uh, basically by paying for the fuel, which was uh, $40,000 Canadian, uh, I basically got to go up there. I got to kind of get checked out in the airplane, uh, do some flights, some training, and then be in the right seat flying it to Oshkosh. And I did the takeoff and the landing, takeoff out of Canada and the landing at Oshkosh. And and after it landed at Oshkosh, I was I was done with it. And then they, they played with it during the show and, and had a great time displaying it. I think everybody really enjoyed it. Yeah, I remember seeing it there and uh, was just completely awestruck by its size. I, I don't think it's easy to describe what it's like to see it sitting out there on a lake. Um, Kermit, other than its practicality of operations, kind of what what was in what was going through your mind when you were seeking a Sunderland? Did you kind of fall into this, or were you actually out there looking for one? No, I wasn't looking for it, but it's kind of interesting. It's like um, you know, when I early started collecting, it's kind of like you know what would pop up on the radar, what was available, and you know, owning a Sunderland to most people is hanging an albatross around your neck. I don't mean a Grumman albatross. I mean, like the metaphor albatross. And and basically, it's like, you know, unless look at most museums, what do you do? If you can get it inside, that's the end of its life. OK, uh, the sister ship to this is a Sangringham and it's in the museum in Southampton. It'll never fly again. Uh, at least I've got the opportunity to, you know, go out and fly it some more because of, you know, my uh, forethought of having her on a lake and my fascination with you know, trying to keep things like this going at some point. Um, of course, I've had my fun with it, you know, for a while, and I've focused on other things, but the potential is there to get it flying again. Kermit, can you talk to us a little bit about the history of your airplane and where it was built? Well, uh, it was built at the factory in Belfast, I think, and uh, that looks like probably somewhere there. It's in, uh, you know, Ireland. And uh, basically, it flew with, uh, started with the Brit, flew in World War II. It was a patrol bomber. And the Sunderlands were, you know, military airport planes for, you know, taking supplies. Uh, they had depth charge capabilities. Uh, you know, they'd look for submarines and things like that and uh, rescue pilots and stuff. So it was a kind of pretty much a utility airplane. And uh, uh, my airplane started off flying for the British. And then I believe it flew for, well, it flew for the Canadians and I think also the Norwegians. I may be wrong on the Canadians, but I knew it flew for the, the Norwegians. But it flew for with three different countries during the war. And then at the end of the war, it was uh, uh, purchased by uh, the New Zealand Air Force, believe it or not. And it flew out of, uh, I think, on the west side of the Big Bay in Auckland, New Zealand. And they used to take it to the Fijian Islands and things like that, you know, and they flew it around there. And eventually there was a uh, Ansett flying boats out so of... Before we get into the fl Ansett flying boats, we've got a couple pictures here um, that will kind okay. of show people the, the factory there in Belfast. Um, We've got a big thank you to all the old Belfast Facebook group uh, who supplied images of the factory where the airplane was built. Um, it's not actually in any of these images, but this is after a raid on that factory by the Luftwaffe. Um, it's kind of interesting because we in the United States don't generally associate 
photos of aircraft production with battle damage and you know blown up factories but uh, that's very much something they were contending with uh, in the early days of the war over there in the UK uh, that's a short sterling in the factory uh, another kind of an interesting thing uh, was that the Shorts factory was co-owned by Harlan and Wolf, the people who built the Titanic. Uh, Kermit, is there evidence of a shipbuilding tradition that, that is clear in the Sunderland? Oh, wow. It's the only four-engine flying boat I've ever owned, so I, I, I couldn't tell you. Um, I, I can tell you that, you know, once you learn how to land it it's got a little bit of a shark fin on the bottom and oh my god if you just bring that in so slow and bring it down you cannot even tell when you touch the water there were times i would land and i didn't even know i was in the water you know until you started you know really slowing down but i, I gotta tell you you know the the shots there that factory there looks like the uh, the germans really uh uh messed up uh uh the shorts there in the belfast i'm just saying <laughs> Certainly. Um, we've got a couple interesting images of Sunderlands during the war. Uh, you mentioned they were used for anti-submarine patrols and, and uh, you know, a couple of other interesting things, ferrying cargo and, and, and such like. Kind of an interesting thing. Um, it picked up the name Flying Porcupine, and this is something that uh, people have actually researched a lot, uh, is the British press said the Germans nicknamed it the Flying Porcupine because they were so impressed by its many gun fixtures. Um, that kind of interestingly is a, an anachronistic thing. The Germans never did call it the Flying Porcupine. The uh, 303 caliber machine guns uh, on a Sunderland were not particularly ferocious based on the German assessment of the airplane. Um, it was also thought at one time that radar masts that were equipped to the airplanes might be part of the Flying Porcupine nickname, but it turns out to basically have just been a fabrication by the British press. Um, the reason I wanted to share this picture with everyone tonight is uh, it was very, very common during the war to actually edit out the radar masts over the tail. And this is a rare photo that actually does show those radar masts on the airplane. Um, this is kind of an interesting one, Kermit. Um, you operating the flying boat, you know, when you were landing in lakes and things like that, you kind of have to have a boat or a motor launch or something to get out to the airplane. So loading even simple cargoes can be kind of challenging. Can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, how you were able to transport a boat with you to service the airplane? Well, it was interesting. Um, basically, the door where the guys are going there on the left below the pilot seat, that's the main door. If they're trying to put something in the little side uh, door there under the uh you know the number two engine uh there's a little bit of a galley hatch that we have i assume would have been there on the military version because mine was converted later but uh basically we actually had believe it or not when we came over we had a crew of six and we had three americans uh myself uh somebody that was a mechanic of my uh ai at the time uh, inspector airframe guy that signed off the airplanes and uh, i had another guy that was kind of my my flight engineer he was a mechanic as well but he was learning to be the flight engineer and then the british crew comprised of the the, the guy that had been flying the airplane as the captain uh the mechanic that had been uh, operating it and the british flight engineer that had been the british flight engineer so we were kind of learning and sharing information and you know it was kind of interesting the british kind of operated one way and the americans kind of came in and we were like well, i don't know we're going to try it. we're going to do it this way we actually had about a probably a seven foot blow up boat with like a a small horsepower on the back there and we got to where we would land somewhere and the boat we, we would put it inside that front door and we basically you know we'd land and uh you know and you got to remember every place that i landed i had to go before the trip and figure out every it was going to be a different country i had to figure out where i was going to land what was the water depth what could I moor to? How am I going to clear customs and get them to where I'm landing in the water? And where am I going to get airplane gas? Okay. I literally, before I went over to England, I had to stop at all these potential places and talk to people and arrange for things. But I mean, I felt like Charles Lindbergh, you know, kind of doing the, the Northwest uh, passage ramp, you know, through to Asia, you know, going through Alaska and stuff. So I literally had to redo all that. And so anyway, we would land somewhere. 
and my flight engineer that worked for me at the time, you know, he also was my my bowsman because you have to have somebody that you see where the turret in this picture is kind of pushed to the back. Well, they do the guy up there front. He has got to pick up and take off the uh, you know the rope from the the mooring buoy. So anyway, we had this blow up raft, and I would land the airplane. We'd let the engines cool down a little bit. I would shut down the inboards because I'm steering the airplane with the one and four, the outboard engines, because remember, there's no rudder. Okay, you can only steer it with the engines while the engines are running. And then uh, he would basically shove the, the, the raft out, the, the thing, while we're moving, he would pump it up the rest of the day we're there, stick the motor on it, start it, and take off and go talk to the guys on shore. And, and you know, before we ever, you know, so we always had somebody that was, uh, you know, uh, you know, we had a boat on board that we could use. We were very fortunate um, when it was in England, any time that they would uh, fuel it, they would have like a boat or a, a raft or kind of like over here, what we use as a pontoon boat. And they would take 55 gallon drums, they'd fill them up at the shore, take the boat out there uh, with the flying boat at the mooring buoy, and they would hand pump or take a battery with them or something, and they would, you know, have to service the airplane out on the water. Well, we thought, well, damn, that seems like a lot of work. So when we first landed in Ireland, I, it was calm and all that stuff. We grabbed our little boat. We just towed the damn thing right, right up to the frickin' dock. There wasn't a lot of wind, so it wasn't a problem. We could control the, you know, push the boat away and stuff. And uh, we, we just had a fuel truck come out from the airport, and we just filled it up like we were in an airport. And we did that at every stop. Uh, except when we finally got to Oshkosh, you know, we had to do it with uh, 55 gallon drums. But every place we stopped, we just pulled the airplane up to the dock and a fuel truck pulled up and we filled up the up the tanks. <laughs> and the British guys were looking at us like, where did these guys come from? <laughs> well, anything to make life a little bit easier. Uh, these next couple pictures are really kind of special. Um, they come to us from Aussie Airliners, a group down in Australia that kind of has tracked the history of this airplane. Um, this is an image of your actual Sunderland uh, when it was still approximately in its post-war Mark V configuration. Um, interestingly, and, and Kermit, you can tell us a little bit about this in a moment. Um, it was in storage with the Royal New Zealand Air Force and was actually requested uh, to be transferred to Australia to be converted into a kind of post-war civilianized version uh, to operate with Ansett Airlines after they lost uh, one of their purpose-built uh, flying boats that was servicing the Lord Howe route. So Kermit, as we look at this, you know, we can see this is its delivery flight and it arriving in Australia. Um, you can still see its uh, RNZAF registration underneath the white paint that's been applied to the rear fuselage. And uh, this is it obviously landing as well. You can see it still has um, the bomb the bomb bay doors here on the yeah. side of the airplane. The bombs actually come out on rails and extend under the wing. Kermit, can you tell us a little bit about what it's like to land one of these on the water as we're looking at these great images? Um, it's really not especially choppy. Can, can you talk about the sort of maximum sea conditions for the airplane and, and what it's like to try to operate it from maybe not the calmest of waters? Um, we never really had anything that was, well, uh, more than I got to tell you, the first two flights, uh, the person that had been flying the airplane, um, and I got to tell you too, <laughs> when I bought this airplane, I had a single engine seaplane rating in a Piper Cub, okay? <laughs> single engine Piper Cub. Uh, later, I got the Grumman Duck, you know, so I'm flying a, you know, World War II airplane with a 1200 horsepower. So I'd flown, I got a single engine. When I bought this, I had to go get a multi-engine seaplane rating, okay? So I went down to uh, the local place here. I got a multi-engine seaplane rating with a twin CB, okay? So everybody knows what a twin C is. It's a little small thing, got two engines, okay? And and it took me about two, th two and a half, three hours, and I had my rating, okay? Okay, the next plane I flew was this thing across the Atlantic, okay? And when we did the test flight, because the airplane hadn't flown in two years, uh, the guy who had been flying the airplane was in the left seat. I was in the right seat. I got a kind of a dispensation from the, because it's still under British registration when we flew at home, okay? And uh, because we could not 
for in American, we had to go under experimental exhibition. So the FAA won't do that. You have to be in the United States to get that experimental exhibition. So we had to fly it over on the British registry. So I had to, I got a special dispensation from the British CAA to be able to fly right seat in this, okay? So the first two flights were, I was in the right seat. And, you know, I'd practice looking at all the checklists and blah, 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 and all that stuff. And uh, so I'm sitting there, and the first time we flew it, I oh, that's pretty cool, blah, blah, blah. Then he goes, and we went a little bit outside the, the mouth of the, the Solent there, and it was a little bit more choppy. Man, he crashed this thing on. And I'm thinking to myself, what have I got myself into? Well, then after that, after his second flight, I did all the flying from the left seat. I was in the left seat, and... Uh, as you can see here, you see how the left wing is slightly dipped down? Well, part of that is because of the torque of the engines turning to the right. And th at first, you know, there was no horizon on the, the panel because it has kind of a curved panel. And I couldn't really tell that that left float was, you know, in the water or whatever. And so what we did is we got a piece of string and we tied it across the, the, the panel above the panel, you know, so we had an artificial horizon, it was a piece of string. And so from then on, you know, I would, I would always start off with full right aileron, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so I got that figured out, but uh, man, I got, I, and you, you have to, when you fly this thing and you land, you got to realize you can, when you hit that buoy, if you have the engines running really at any kind of speed, you're going to overrun the buoy if there's no wind, okay? So the first thing you do is cool the engines down and you shut the inboards down. And then you basically taxi around, you line up with the buoy coming in from downwind, okay? And we always, in Florida here, since we don't have a uh, a, a tide and in the Solent when we were flying there was like a six or eight foot tide so sometimes the wind you'd show one thing but the tide was moving the current the other way and only one time ever did I miss the buoy and it was because of the tide but basically uh, and this I talk about this a little more on my video on YouTube but basically you now what you're doing is you're steering the airplane you're downwind of the buoy so you're pointed into the wind you're steering the airplane with the outboard engines but even with the engines all the way back, you're going to overrun the buoy. So what you do is when you get, you line up, you try and be right behind the little telltale buoy, which we have a, we have a buoy with a rope on it that basically goes downwind. So you're going into it. So you know you're directly into the wind if you don't have a current, okay, or a tide. And so basically you're lined up with that. When you finally get lined up with that, you never, you pull the throttles all the way back and you don't touch them again, okay? So now what you do, because the wind's on the nose, you sail the airplane. So what you do is, if you want, uh, if you want to turn to the right, you turn the, the ailerons to the left. And the, and the right aileron goes down because it's so far out, the wind will get it. It will turn the nose to the right, and then the airplane will start steering to the right. So once you get within about a couple hundred yards from the buoy, you're sailing the airplane with the rudder and the ailerons to keep it going straight with the engines all the way back. But you're still going too fast. You're going to overrun the buoy. So then what you have to do is when you get really close, and you've almost got it made, you got the, the mag switches are above you on the top of the cockpit. You start basically pulling the mags off to slow you down and to steer the airplane. So if I wanna to go to the right, I shut the right engine off with the mag switch. The left engine's still running. It turns me slightly. And before the right engine quits, I push the switch back in so it'll start again. And eventually when you're getting really close, you're pulling both switches off. And before they, you see what I'm getting? Then, then when the guy finally picks up the buoy in the front, he gives you a thumbs up and then you shut the engine down on the outboard. So. And Amazing. presumably breathe a giant sigh of relief. Oh, um, no. That, that, yeah, then, then the rum comes out. <laughs> <laughs> Kermit, the uh, the airplane in the pictures, obviously, we're going to talk a little bit about how it was converted a little later in the presentation. But you've chosen not to turn it back, your airplane, back all the way into a Sunderland uh, of wartime configuration. Can you talk a little bit about why you've chosen to keep the airplane as a kind of monument to the the era of the great passenger flying boats? Well, okay, this airplane was built as a Sunderland Mark III, okay? And I was going to ask you to go back to some previous pictures, but they're pretty far back, so I won't. But the original engines in this were Bristol Hercules, and the British engines actually spun the other way. If you look at the pictures here, this spins 
pretty much the way all American airplanes spin. And if you're in the cockpit, it spins, you know, clockwise to the pilot, okay? And so basically, this airplane was originally built with the Bristol Hercules, and the engine spun to the left, okay? And uh, they were sleeve valve engines, and they, they had, are you ready for this? This airplane has 16 hours of endurance, okay? The British Hercules engines did not have feathering propellers, okay? So if you're eight hours, seven hours out off the shore and you lose an engine, you can't even feather the propeller. So somewhere along the line, somebody got the idea, the British had been flying PBY Catalinas and they said, you know, let's try putting some PBY Catalina QECs on the Sunderland. And so this airplane eventually went back and was upgraded at the factory to a Mark V. And those are basically, you know, in effect, an evolution of the PVY QECs. So now the engines turn to the right. They have feathering propellers. And uh, that was, a, I think that was a big help. And probably a lot of the pilots of the day probably, you know, wiped their brow, the sweat off their brow. <laughs> So you've chosen to keep the passenger interior in it and everything largely as you found it. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about your kind of desire to share the stories of, of the great era of the, the passenger flying boats? Yeah, well, to basically finish follow up with your question there, um, first of all, to convert it back to a Sunderland would be a monumental task. The parts availability, I mean, finding turrets and blah, blah, blah. And the more I thought about it, you know, and it, it, it truly, it was a consideration uh, early on because there, there's a few things here and around that I kind of serve. But in the long run, in the long run, I realized the significance to me in history of the flying boat was not the military application. It was the romantic era of the passenger flying boat, you know, Pan Am Clipper, Boeings and Martin Clippers and stuff, you know. So, uh, so this actually has a double deck. And there, when you get in that door in the front there, you know, you go in. There's a lower deck. This thing will hold 36 passenger people in the configuration it's in. And you go in the back there. You can go up a little staircase, and there's like a first class lounge up there with a little bar. Okay. And so when we got the airplane, um, it was in this configuration. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, I need to leave it this way. And also, too, a little bit of history. Um, there, so after the war, there obviously wasn't a lot of need for flying boats, especially in military configuration, because they built all these runways around the world. And that was kind of the demise of the flying boat, because they were trying to get bombers and things to different uh, theaters of the war. And so with all these runways, which was the reason why if they didn't have a runway, you could get there on a flying boat. And so the Lord Howe run, which was basically flying out of Rose Bay in Sydney to an island about halfway to New Zealand that didn't have a runway. Uh, that's how they used to get passengers back and forth. Well, finally, they built a runway on the island and that was the end of that. And so uh, this airplane was converted by ANSIP flying boats. So the Australians did a conversion there. Now, the, the, a, the, a lot of the military Sunderlands went back to the factory in Belfast after the war. They were converted by the factory into a passenger flying boat, and it was called a Sangringham. So the sister ship to this in Southampton, and the airplane that this replaced that was damaged and lost in a storm on Lord Howe Island. And that's why Ansett bought this one from uh, the New Zealand Air Force. This airplane was not a factory conversion. So from an FAA perspective, I cannot fly passengers for hire in this airplane because it was not a factory conversion. So, you know, I thought about a couple of things that'd be really cool to be able to do that. So somewhere down the road, I, I really have no interest to making a military airplane. Um, so somewhere down the road is there's an opportunity to become a licensed station for the, com the, the company or the organization that owns the shorts, uh, you know, Sunderland's type certificates, and we convert it to a Sangringham, and then we can fly. I don't know. That would be a dream of mine, uh, and it would be a hell of a lot easier than building a Boeing 314 Clipper from scratch. <laughs>
So you've got us onto the subject of Clippers, which is well-timed. Um, you had the opportunity to relive some of those glory days of, of the romantic era of flying boats. Um, you actually are the last person to have taxied a four-engine flying boat up to the uh, the old Pan Am Clipper base in Miami. That's now City Hall down there. Can can you talk to us a little bit about that particular experience? Yeah, this is uh, that's a Sikorsky S42 landing in the distance. This is a uh, Biscayne Bay. It's a uh, basically Coconut Grove now. They call this. Uh, 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 Oh, wait a second, I'm getting a confused. Dinner Key. It's called Dinner Key. It was a little island there. They kind of filled it in. It's mostly a marina now. But basically, this was the original Pan Am Clipper base to fly down to the Caribbean out of uh, Miami. And uh, uh, like you said, it's now the Miami City Hall. Uh, there were some hangars kind of over to the left of this circular parking lot there. They used to operate a Coast Guard hangar there. It's all basically uh, boats. But if you go to Coconut Grove, this building is still there. And if you go inside, oh my God, it is so cool. It's all Art Deco. Uh, and this is a bit of an inspiration for the, uh, the, the seaplane base terminal that I want to build at Fantasy of Flight in Act 3 Part 2. And if you see, there's a little bit of an upper deck. You see some people over there watching the flying boat land. And we're going to have an upper deck restaurant, blah, 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 and the little circular drive and all that stuff. It's going to be really, really cool. Plus some hangers over to the left. It'll all be period. And uh, inside, if you if you get a chance, any of the, the uh, uh, listeners here, you know, go do a research on the original deal and look at some of the pictures inside this building. And it's still pretty much kept that way. There was a big globe that was in the middle of the floor that was painted that I might even I, it revolved, I think, at the time it was in the middle of the terminal building there and where you got your tickets and all that stuff. And I was painted it as a globe. Well, that globe eventually got moved out of here because they didn't need it in the middle of you know, doing committee meetings in Miami City Hall. And it ended up down at the Museum of Science, I believe, just down uh, the road there uh, in Coconut Grove. So anyway, a really cool thing. And it's an inspiration for something that I want to build one day. I don't know if we're going to do it exactly like this, but what I want to do is I want to do something that has this feel, maybe combined a little bit with the uh, 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 what what uh, treasure 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 island treasure key you know in San Francisco which was the second Pan Am Clipper base that basically launched people off you know to the to the Pacific out of San Francisco. It's certainly an amazing period in history, Kermit. You were actually able to fly up and taxi up next to it because you carried the Olympic torch on board your aircraft. Can you tell us a little bit more about what led to that set of circumstances and what it was like to carry something? like as special as the Olympic torch on board the airplane. Yeah, this it was it was pretty cool. I can't remember how we got connected to this, but uh, this was the Olympic torch relay to the uh, uh, 1996 Olympic Games in Atlanta, Georgia, okay? And of course, what they do is if 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 the they bring the flame over from from Greece, okay? And they basically bring the Olympic flame over and when it's in an airplane like an airliner or something like that it's in kind of a three-part thing the flames lit and it's protected to where it's not going to catch the airplane on fire okay so uh but then once it gets over here and they start the run and everybody gets to you know run the torch then it's an actual torch that has a flame you know and i was fortunate enough we bought one as a souvenir and put a little thing in it's in a it's hanging in my executive conference room but basically uh we flew the airplane down to sarasota yeah, Sarasota Bay, and the torch was run out uh, from the city, and it was put on a dock on a police boat, and we had landed, we got there a couple hours early, and we were sitting there just anchored, you know, because we weren't going to moor for the night, so we just basically landed in the bay and anchored, and they kind of knew where we were going to get, and we thought, yeah, no big deal, they're going to bring this up, and they were going to give it to us in one of these little containers, which is what the guy's holding there in his hand, okay, it's not the normal torch that you run with okay well we thought okay we'll pick up the torch and we'll go well what i didn't realize is when the police boat came out there was this wall of freaking pleasure boats behind him and i'm going oh my god how are we going to get out of here without freaking getting somebody okay and so we got the this the the uh the runner there um you know that's kind of holding the he's either holding that or 
don't know if that's a fire extinguisher or what anyway. So anyway, somebody ran the, the we never touched the torch. It was brought out uh, by this guy. And then we got the torch. And I, I think he sat up in the airplane. I can't remember if we just took the torch or he went with us or whatever. But the bottom line is we had the torch. I never held the torch. But then we then we had to start one of the engines. And I'm going, you know, I've got my guy up there like waving everybody away. So once we started, and you got to remember, once you start the outboard engine, you're moving and you're turning, okay? And until you can get that other engine going, you've got no way to steer the airplane. Okay, so the first one gets started. Now we're moving, now we're turning, we're chewing everybody away. The boats are trying to stay out of the way. Now we get the other one going. And then once we got a little bit of speed and moving and people kind of moved away, we kind of got away from everybody, started the other two engines, you know, let them warm up, did our run up and we took off. And so I was the longest relay of the games there because I flew the torch 200 miles from Sarasota Bay, we landed in Biscayne Bay, made a couple of passes, we landed in the bay, and I'm the last person to taxi up and fly a four engine flying boat into the original Pan Am Clipper base. That's pretty cool. And what was even cooler, but I gotta tell you before this, so we get down there and we've done all this preparation and we'd spent all this time, we put all this effort into it and we get down there and blah, blah, and there's all these people standing on the dock and blah, blah. And I don't know, there's a, a famous flute player called Nestor Torres, and he was the one that was gonna receive the torch down on the dock, okay? So we're sitting there and there's all these people and everybody's looking and taking pictures. And I went down with the torch and I'm in the boat and I go over there and we sit there and we pull up to the thing and everybody's watching, taking pictures. They hand the torch to the guy, he runs off and everybody leaves. And I'm like, that's it, that's it. Oh my God, it was the biggest letdown anyway. So we had dinner somewhere that night. And then the next night, I think, uh, or it might've been that night, it was, it was the, 100th year anniversary 100th year anniversary of miami or something and we weren't supposed to be drinking but we were and we went out in a police boat and uh you know we weren't flying or anything we weren't operating the boat but uh, we were out there and the, we were in this police boat watching all these fireworks out over the water you know because it was the 100th anniversary of celebration of miami it was really cool um anyway so we ended up uh, you know we flew back the next day and that's the last time the airplane flew that was in 1996 so uh, we went ahead and parked it, and uh, uh, one day when we get it down and get the seaplane base going, you know, we'll we'll take another look at it. Kermit, uh, we've got a really good sort of side-on view of the airplane in its ANSET flying boats livery, and we're going to talk a little bit more about how the conversion was done uh, in the next couple of slides. Can you perhaps provide people a rundown uh, based on looking at this airplane this way as to kind of how the lower deck is configured and you know how that bar is positioned on the upper level, um, just so people can get a kind of sense of how the airplane is put together in terms of its cabin? Yeah, well, basically uh, that the, the, the green line down the middle of the airplane is a, probably a little bit below the floor line. But as you can imagine, you can have a deck about where the water level is and and basically when people are sitting in the windows down or sitting in the chairs down below they're basically eye level looking out those windows so if you would stand up in the in the cabin there uh you know the windows would be below you and then back where it says ANSET there was a little stair that went up uh, halfway you would make a 90 degree turn to the left you could look back in the tail and then you would go up another little stair uh, so the stair basically had a dog leg uh, and then in the upper deck those windows were added those weren't there as part of a world war ii airplane and there was a little bit of a second deck and somebody put i mean it wasn't really it was not very elaborate by any means and uh anyway but uh that's kind of where the airplane uh the same configuration so she was called Islander at that point, and uh, here's here's a kind of later livery that she wore. Kermit, can can you tell us a little bit about how you get the boats out of the way? Uh, this is departing Rose Bay in Sydney to take people to Lord Howe Island. Um, obviously a very interesting service that they ran, but uh, one of the last really revenue driving passenger carrying flying boat operations in the world. What do you, do, what do you know about that operation and and Basically, how do you safely operate from the water? Um, 
Well, I mean, you know, safety should be obvious with, you know, they, they've always got launches that are watching them and, you know, and that kind of stuff, you know, and, uh, you know, people, uh, obviously, if they're operating, I think they can dodge the, uh, you know, the boats and stuff. But uh, Ansett flying boats, once Lord Howe uh, built a runway, that was the end of the days here. And there's, there's, I think there's, there's a YouTube clip there that you can find uh, that the Australians did and kind of reminisced about it. Um, but what happened was a famous Pan Am pilot, Charlie Blair, who eventually, eventually married uh, the actress Maureen O'Hara, uh, he was a famous thing. He bought these two airplanes from Ansett Flying Boats. They flew both airplanes back uh, to the Caribbean. And I got to tell you, too, these, uh, these, this airplane and the one that's in the Southampton Flying Museum are the only ones that have flown completely around the world. Uh, because, no, wait a second. Yeah, because my, I don't, know, I don't know where the other one went, but mine went east out of, after the war, east down to New Zealand. And then eventually it flew east, continuing to the Caribbean. And then eventually it flew east to England. So this, my, this airplane's flown all around the world. And what, so when Charlie Blair got it, he flew both of them, this one and the sister ship, which was a Belfast converted Sangringham. He flew him back to uh, operate at about, I think, Puerto Rico, somewhere down around there. He was going to fly him out of the Caribbean. And when he got him here to license him, the FAA said, oh, you can't, this one you can't fly for passengers or hire because it was not a Sangringham. So mine is considered a modified Sunderland. It is not a Sangringham. It's a modified Sunderland. And because of that fact, I can't fly passengers for hire with the FAA. I probably could in England. So the only way we're ever going to be able to legally fly passengers is to convert this somehow legally paperwork wise into a Sangringham, which, like I said, would be a dream of mine. Because actually, the Sangringham configuration is like a cool old flying boat. And this one was just really done at a level to just fill some passenger seats because it was like a four hour flight over and back to Lord Howe Island. So, you know, uh, anyway, at some point it'd be nice to do that, but we can all dream, can't we? Certainly. Um, we've got a couple images here, Kermit, of the airplane undergoing uh, the modifications to become the, the civilianized version of itself. I, I thought they might be interesting for people to see um, what followed those earlier sequence of images when it was arriving at the shops in Rose Bay. Um, obviously here they've removed that nose turret. Um, we've had a question asked about how they were how you're still able to service the mooring buoy and, and get outside the nose of the airplane with the turret removed. Um, this next image, I think, should go some distance to helping that. Uh, they actually fared it over and included a hatch. Kermit, yours has a kind of a telltale bump in the nose that isn't there on a factory converted Sandringham uh, that, uh, that leads to some of the problems with perceiving the horizon out of that airplane from what I'm told. Um, no, I don't think the horizons, the, the, the horizon issue is not that bump. The horizon issue is, is the panel has a big curve to it. And when you're looking at, you know, basically the top of a beach ball, you can't tell if you're level or not. So that's why we put the string there. It doesn't appear to look that way in the picture, but, but it is at some level. Um, yeah, I don't know why they put that bulbous nose in there, uh, except to give the, 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 the bowsman some head clearance, but originally, when the turret was there, there was a little crank and the turret would actually retract back into the airplane. And so probably a lot of that structure up there uh, might have been kind of almost already there. They would have built up the front part of it. But, uh, but the turret actually used to come back into the airplane. The guy would go under or around the turret to get up into the front to pick up the, the mooring buoy. Just another picture here from the factory that is showing the tail cone uh, being fared over. Obviously, there was a gun position in the tail as well um, during the war, but was enclosed. Yeah. This is a, an interesting photo that came to us from Aussie Airliners as well that actually shows Islander beached on Lord Howe Island. Uh, part of the reason the flying boats were so useful in this service was it's a somewhat underdeveloped island and is a, a kind of a rocky outcrop about 500 miles uh, off the coast of Australia. And uh, 
this is them using manpower to put the airplane back in the water after it had uh, a maintenance issue that led to an unfortunate beaching. Yeah, this was, uh, and this is what happened to the airplane uh, that this replaced. I mean, it was lost in a storm, you know, run up on the beach, uh, and the damage was so much that they had to scrap the airplane. Um, and more than likely, the other airplane, the Sangringham and the Sam Southampton Museum, which was called Beachcomber, more than likely, it probably ended up on the beach at some point in its life, too. So this was, uh, you know, once they got the runway there, that was the, that was the end of this. So they, they just didn't need, to, didn't need the service anymore. And it was a little bit of a kind of a, not an atoll, but a bit of a bay there that they could land the airplane in, you know, they kind of kept it out of the choppy waters. But, uh, you know, like I said, you know, if you're sitting there and you're moored and a storm comes or, uh, you know, it's like having a baby in a forest of wild animals, you know, it just comes with the territory and uh, sometimes you don't sleep at night. <laughs> Certainly a sentiment that I think anyone who owns a boat can relate to. It's somewhat more unusual for an airplane. Um, this next image comes from an excellent uh, web page uh, operated by uh, Jeff Goodall, um, who was one of the enthusiasts who found out that the flying boats were gonna be ceasing their operations to Lord Howe Island as a new runway was under construction and was among the last people to actually ride Islander out to Lord Howe. And this image is from the, uh, the lower deck uh, out under the wing, giving people kind of an opportunity to see into that bay. Operations were extremely tide sensitive. Uh, you had to kind of come and go on a high tide. So it wasn't, it wasn't a case where they tried to keep the airplanes there for extended periods or anything like that. Kermit, this next one shows you, your Sunderland flying out of the UK. And I wanted to use it as a kind of opportunity to have you tell us about the route you took to come back to the United States after purchasing the airplane in the UK. Yeah, obviously, like I said, the airplane hadn't flown in two years uh, when I bought it. And so we did uh, you know, considerable amount of work on it. I purchased it in, February of 1994, and we flew it across uh, in uh, the summertime uh, in time, literally to arrive a minute before our scheduled air show uh, slot at Oshkosh in 1994, which is pretty cool. Of course, we timed it when we departed, but uh, this is a, a test flight. We did a bunch of test flying, and this is over the the needles, basically, you know, in southern England. And uh, obviously, it was pretty cool to have arranged for a photo mission, and uh, you know, there's some other cool shots. But uh, basically, uh, you know, we were just flying the airplane around, and when we eventually left. Uh, the intent was with 16 hours of range, the intent was the first stop was to fly to uh, Ireland, okay? And we landed, uh, well, we flew by the old Pan Am base there on Ireland at Foynes, okay? And everybody was out there and waving to us or whatever. So we made a couple of passes, but we ended up, but that was connected to uh, the ocean, okay, and and there was no service for fuel or anything. So we landed on a Loch Derg, which was kind of a freshwater lock uh, in Ireland, uh, fueled it, spent the night, and then the next day we flew up to, uh, the original intent, like I said, was to fly um, from Loch Derg to somewhere in Canada, okay? And like I said, I'd hit all these spots going over and I went to uh, St. John's, I went to Gander. Uh, I did not go to Goose Bay, but what happened was two weeks prior to us leaving, we're working on the airplane, preparing everything. Uh, we'd been watching the winds and everything and it was like the winds were against us because everything is you know, coming from the from the west to the east. So we were gonna have headwinds. And I thought, you know, let's, let me fly up to Iceland. So two weeks before we left, I flew up to Iceland and there was a, somebody that was in aerobatics that somebody knew and he kind of hosted me there. And uh, so I checked it out, checked out fuel. There was a mooring buoy there. It used to be a Sunderland base in World War II, just south of Reykjavik uh, Airport. And so there was a big movie buoy there and they arranged for fuel and customs. I said, well, forget that. Let's not worry about, are we gonna make it or not? Let's just fly up to Iceland. So the second day, the second leg, what we did is we took off out of uh, uh, Ireland and we flew to Iceland. 
Uh, there was a little bit of weather kind of there, and we kind of came under it, went around the island uh, by Keflavik. There's a big Air Force base there. We flew around, came in, landed fine. You know, we were, we were under the clouds and stuff. And, uh, you know, we landed there, and we spent a couple of days. Uh, we had a governor that was leaking, a couple other little things that we fixed. We were kind of watching the weather. I uh, got to go spend some time sitting in the Blue Lagoon, which was a really cool experience, some hot springs west of Reykjavik. So anyway, so we spent and we tooled around, basically waiting for the weather to clear over Canada. By this time, I started calling around. I was a little reluctant. I wasn't sure where to land. And I checked out Goose Bay, and they happened to have a seaplane base there. They happened to have a buoy. They happened to have a bar. It was all this. And I go, oh, my God, let's just go there. Thank God we did. It was the best thing that ever happened. It was the only place I didn't check out. And basically, uh, it was fascinating because what should have been a pretty long flight, we left Iceland after sitting there for four days with a 40 knot tailwind. Oh my God, it was so cool. We never got above 2,500 feet. And all of a sudden, you know, we could kind of see something on the horizon. And the cool part about it is since we went to Goose Bay, we were a little further north than had we'd gone to Gander or St. John's, we got to fly right past the southern end of Greenland. And there's all this ice. It was in the middle of the summer, man. We froze our butts off. In fact, we opened the windows on the side to do some video. Uh, and we didn't have any heat or anything. And uh, we opened up. The video cameras wouldn't work. It was so cold. This is in July, okay? So anyway, we flew across. And, you know, normally when pilots get out of, over water, they kind of get a little, uh, you know, uh, tense okay well let me tell you something in this flying boat i'm flown over all these damn icebergs and ice pack i've never been so happy to be out of, out over open water in my life you know so anyway so it was a, it was about a five hour flight to the southern end of greenland and it was about another five hours it was a 10 hour flight from from ireland to uh or from iceland excuse me to goose bay we landed there it was a beautiful place it was the a man if i couldn't have picked a better place to land uh, we landed, pulled in, and eventually, you know, we just pulled the flying boat up. Then uh, that afternoon, uh, filled it up with fuel, stuck it back on, towed it out with our little dinghy. And the next day, we took off and headed down uh, the St. Lawrence with the intent to either land at a place around Montreal or whatever, or uh, Toronto Island uh, uh, Airport, which there's a big, I can't remember what the lake there, it's not Lake Superior, but it's one of those big lakes uh, just by Toronto. And we ended up, there was a massive bunch of thunderstorms and we kind of got pushed around some weather and, you know, technically we were supposed to be uh, VFR. I didn't even have an instrument rating at the time. And uh, we were flying over VFR and, you know, um, I, uh, I will tell you, we always saw the ground. We never flew through a cloud. And if there was any lightning and black stuff outside the windows, I never saw it. <laughs> but anyway, we ended up in... Uh, coming into Toronto, the weather was so freaking clear. It was so gorgeous. We were so happy. We landed there, spent the night, and uh, the next day was the opening day of Oshkosh. And of course, EAA had uh, arranged for customs because you got to remember, every place I landed, I had to get airplane gas. I had to clear customs because it was a different country. And so, you know, we arrived there literally a minute before our scheduled air show uh, slot time on the first day of the flying. And I think we flew every day and we had a, we had a, uh, 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 rented a houseboat. We had people, I think we charged five bucks or six bucks or something to go out. And when people were going back and forth, you know, from, uh, where the pioneer airport or the pioneer uh, motel was, and we ran out of there. And then, uh, we left the airplane there because my seaplane ramp wasn't done. We had a set of beaching gear, a second set we had shipped up to Oshkosh. And after the fly-in, we basically put the beaching gear on, uh, we brought the boat in and we basically hired a crane and the British had never seen this, but I knew in the manual there was a way to pick the airplane up. So we had a special hoist made, I had custom made uh, based on what the manual said. And we just pulled the thing up there, hooked it up, picked the crane up, picked the thing out with the beach and gear, stuck it on the ground, rolled it over. I put an eight foot fence around it. We shrink wrapped off the windows and anything that, you know, would have been uh, a thing. And, you know, there's pictures of it sitting on the land in the snow. It was stayed the whole winter. We put it back in the water in 1985, uh, flew it again at Oshkosh. And by that time, uh, you know, we went ahead and Fantasy Flight was uh, being uh, pretty close to being built. We went ahead and... Uh, uh, 
uh, we opened in the winter of 1995 or, you know, uh, 11, 11, it was November armistice day. And, uh, anyway, so then it's, and then it sat another year here in the lake, uh, just west of fantasy of flight. And we finally got it out when the hangar got done. So we opened in the museum. It's been inside pretty much ever since, unless we roll it out for, you know, either special occasions or we got to do something in the hangar or something like that. Kermit, you might be the last person to take an airplane like this uh, across a major ocean. Uh, was that on your mind while you were operating it? Not at all. I mean, I somebody can always do it again, but uh, at least at this point, it's pretty cool. I was in the left seat flying it across, so <laughs> that's pretty neat. And also, too, a little bit of uh, follow-up on that. Every place we went to, we pretty much had you know, in effect, unlimited water for takeoff and landing, okay? We're flying off locks, we're flying off of rivers, we're flying off Lake Winnebago, you know, the Atlantic Ocean. And and it's like, there was not a problem. Well, when I brought the airplane down, the lake I've got here only in two directions is 6,000 feet long, okay? And I'm going, I don't know if it's going to, I know I can get it in. I don't know if I can get it out. So when we landed here, we had a uh, sunk some concrete with a, with a mooring buoy in a lake just south of Fantasy of Flight here. So we didn't have access to Fantasy of Flight, but it was 12,000 feet long, you know, so it was a couple of miles. And that, I knew that was not an issue. So when we flew the airplane down from Oshkosh, which I think was six hours or something, I can't remember. But anyway, we flew it back. And the airplane cruises about 150 miles an hour. But when we landed here, we landed in a lake to the south. We moored it up there. It sat there for a while. And then eventually I had to figure out, can I land this thing in my lake, okay? Or can I get it out? So what we did was by that time, you know, we had uh, GPSs and stuff. So I basically had a GPS and I put some mooring not mooring buoys, but I put some buoys out in the water like every 500 feet. So I had the first one from 500 feet from the shore, then 1,000 feet, 1,500 feet. I just wanted to figure out what it was going to take to get the airplane in and out. And so we did some practice. Surprisingly, this airplane with like quarter flaps down or whatever, the problem was I would get as close as I could to shore but by the time I got 90 degrees and could put all the power in, I'd already burn up 500 feet of the lake, okay? This thing would break water at 65 knots in 2,500 feet. So I was airborne 3,000 feet from the shore. So I figured oh, I can get in and out of, uh, you know, 6,000 feet. So basically, uh, one day we were out flying around. We were going to bring it in. There was a bit of a uh some wind flying down i landed it it was no problem because the lake the six thousand foot this way and this way there's a bit of a dog leg so once you land you can actually turn the boat and you have some more thing but remember this is not like a grumman albatross or a martin mars which has got reversible propellers you're moving forward and you're not stopping so if you think you're gonna you know you got to turn and you got to think ahead in this thing so anyway so we moored it here and you know eventually uh you know anytime we flew it out of fantasy flight and i flew it out you know uh, a number of times and like when we went down did the torch relay uh you know we basically would take off with about a quarter fuel which is four hours so that was plenty and uh you know uh we figured it out. It was pretty cool. I, I enjoyed flying it, and it was a great, great experience. Very fond memories of this airplane and all my experiences with it. This is a shot leaving uh, Cal shot when we were leaving out of England. So, Kermit, this was shared with a, a fan of yours on your Twitter feed. Can you talk a little bit about the response people had to what was possibly the last of the airworthy Sunderlands leaving the UK to come to the United States? Well, um, I wasn't around to hear any of it. <laughs> I had left. Uh, I didn't have to deal with it. But, you know, I mean, certainly they, they, you know, and I had a lot of people, the airplane needs to come back to the UK. Buy. Well, trust me, everybody over there had the opportunity to buy this. They could have bought it and it was in their backyard. I bought it. I had to bring it to my backyard. I mean, think of the all the logistics I had. 
I personally was going to every spot before we brought this back two weeks before looking at places we could land, talking to customs, dealing with fuel people, you know? And uh, I mean, it was a big deal. It's not like, oh, hey, let's go jump in and go. You don't really, it's not like a Grumman Albatross where, oh, well, the water's kind of choppy. Let's go land at this airport and walk out, you know? I mean, it's it's a flying boat and it takes a different set of, uh, considerations to operate it safely and properly. And, uh, and I mean, you got to know what the water depths are. You can't just land somewhere and run aground. I mean, look, the Martin Mars ran aground up at Oshkosh. One of the things that I came up with that I thought was pretty freaking ingenious that I never heard anybody doing in a air, in a, a seaplane. I came up with a deal. I went out and bought a bunch of little five pound weights. OK, I bought a bunch of five pound weights uh, or a couple pound weights or something like that. And the Sunderland with the beaching gear, it draws. Uh, I think it draws six feet without the beaching gear. It draws the tip of the bottom. There is five feet. It could basically draw us five feet. OK. And so basically what I did, I went out. I got some weights. I got some of those little flotation lights that you see on a ski course, you know, where they're like vertical and they're made out of foam. I bought a bunch of those and I tied them up in like six foot lengths. And the plan was, is if we got someplace and we didn't know what the water depth was, we'd fly over and chuck a bunch of them out and we'd fly back and look at them. And if they were vertical, the water was deep enough. And if it was laying over on its side, it wasn't deep enough. Now, how cool and smart is that? I never heard of anybody doing that. I came up with that idea myself. And we used to keep them on the airplane, you know, in case we were out of land somewhere. And we didn't know what the water depth was. It's certainly an ingenious way to solve kind of an unusual problem. Um, Kermit, this next photo is of the airplane up at the seaplane base in Oshkosh. A couple folks have asked us, how did you bring it to Oshkosh? Um, I, not necessarily everyone knows that there's a really cool part of that experience that is the seaplane base out on Lake Winnebago. Can you talk to us a little bit more about what it's like to, to land in that lake and to bring this airplane into this community of seaplane and flying boat enthusiasts? Well, okay. First, a little bit of a correction there. We did not actually go to the seaplane base. The first year we were there in 1994, they put a... Uh, a, a weight down, a concrete weight, and had this buoy. This is probably 1994 when we were there. When we went back the second time, I can't remember, we didn't have access to the buoy or, or the weight, they pulled it up. And what we did was, is we basically, I came up and I had three big boat anchors, and we basically put the boat anchors out there in like a big claw kind of a configuration. So, and then we would basically more of the deal there. We got through the flying fine, but one day after the flying, the wind picked up and the anchors started dragging. Three big freaking boat anchors because they weren't digging in. There was no sand. It must be like a rock bottom there or something. And it was headed towards the seaplane base. But uh, we, the, the second time we weren't like right in that little bay. I don't know. I can't believe they, they put the Martin Mars there because I, I wasn't going to put my boat there. When we pulled up there on the Martin Mars, that close to the seaplane base, and they didn't find out till later when they scraped the bottom, because I went over there and I checked the water depth. When they scraped the bottom on the Martin Mars and they put it back at the mooring buoy where they had it and they went under there, there was like a foot of clearance. It was like not deep enough, you know, and I was like, Anyway, I, but so anyway, we were close enough. The first year we operated the pontoon boat out of the Pioneer uh, Hotel, which was not anywhere near the seaplane base. And the second year we operated the pontoon boat out of the seaplane base, but we were still kind of offshore. Makes sense. Got to prioritize the safe operation of the airplane. Kermit, on your Kermi cam uh, featuring the the Sunderland, you mentioned that one of the most useful things that came along with the airplane was maintenance steps that attach to the leading edge of the wing to allow engine work to be done uh, while the airplane is out over the water. Yeah, this is, uh, I mean, obviously, think about it. You got to maintain the airplane if you're sitting in the water. First thing you want to do is probably put some floats on some of your wrenches in case you drop one. But uh, these basically on both sides of each engine, 
you, you know, you unscrew some little latches there, they fold down. And actually, uh, there's other aspects of this which clip onto the front of each of these leading edge pieces that go down to extend that out and down below, you can actually change engines and propellers that way. This is an earlier engine, which is probably the Bristol Centaurus or whatever. Uh, th although I thought a Centaur, not a Centaurus, I mean the Hercules, uh, which I, maybe it's a Pegasus engine. I'm, anyway, I'm confused right now. But anyway, uh, this is not the, the, the engine that's on the, my airplane is a Pratt Whitney 1830, which is what they use on like DC-3s and Catalinas. So, but yes, and then also there was a provision to where, yeah, you can see the extension where that guy's sitting there. They also had uh, crane uh, things that you could actually connect back on the top of the wing behind the, the main spar or something like that and hook this up and actually drop an engine or pick an engine up and actually change it in the water. Just moving on to the next one here, Kermit. Um, t can you tell us a little bit about the minimum safe crew for operating an airplane like this? You obviously are going to need more than just a pilot and a co-pilot if someone has to be wrangling buoys and so on. Well, legally, you only need three people to operate the airplane, but operationally, you really need four. So you've got a pilot and a co-pilot. You also have a flight engineer on this airplane, monitors the fuel, fuel transfer, engine temps, and all that kind of stuff. He's got a panel back there. He sits facing aft. Uh, so that's the required crew, and somebody has to have a flight engineer license uh, to operate the airplane uh, in the back. Um, but then you also have to have a bowsman. It's nice to have somebody that can run around the airplane uh, and look in case there's a leak or some kind of problem or to go back and get some, uh, you know, some, uh, some food for somebody. Uh, that's uh, the bowsman on ours, you know, picking up the buoy. Uh, and of course, right now I've got the inboards engine shut down. The outboards are running, but they're at idle, but I'm also part of shutting the mags on and off to slow the airplane down as much as possible. Kermit, um, I think there's a question that's likely to come up in the Q&A, so we can probably preempt it now. How do you do a run-up in an airplane with no brakes that's just going to kind of run away with itself while you're doing all of your necessary, uh, you know, pre-takeoff checks? Yeah, well, obviously, what we're going to want to do is take off into the wind, okay? If you've got unlimited uh, space, it's not a problem. But so what we would do here is that once the engines are warmed up to a, a certain degree, uh, and like I said, you remember, we all, we're starting the outboard engines first. And in a close environment, like my little lake, you always start the engine closest to the shore. Because once that engine starts, you're moving forward and you're turning away from shore, okay? So if you can't get the other engine started, then you gotta shut the other one down and then figure out what you're gonna do. And usually on the lake, uh, when we're operating, we'll have somebody in a boat or something like that. Um, and what was your question again? I'm, I... It was just about how do you effectively do the run-up and everything. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Running away from you. Yeah. So in a little lake, what we'll do is what we'll do is we'll warm the engines up. Uh, of course, the, the outboard engines are the first ones to start. So they're the first ones that we're going to run up. So what we'll do is we'll go to the downwind end of the lake, and then we'll basically turn into the wind, because I only have 6,000 feet, we'll run the outboard engines up at the same time and do the mag checks and you know anything else we need to do on the outboard engines. Okay, now we burnt up some of the lake, okay? So then we turn around, now we're going downwind, we run up the inboard engines, two and three, okay? And then if everything checks out, then what we do is everything's run up, we're all ready to go. And the next time we turn into the wind, as close to the shoreline, because I've only got 6,000 feet, off we go. And uh, I'm usually, what I did learn to do was, I would start with the outboard engines first. Uh, when I first went over there, the British pilot was running them all up at the same time. But you get a little bit of water splash initially 
uh, off the, the hull and it was you know hitting the propellers and stuff on the inboards. So what I would do is I would advance the outboard engines first, get them going. When it got up to a certain little point and started rising up out of the water, I would come in with the inboard engines and it would uh, you know keep from getting the propellers uh, you know kind of dings up the leading edges with the water hitting it. All right, Kermit. And uh, just before we move on to Q and A here, one last interesting image, uh, which shows basically the process of grabbing that buoy and you know having the bowsman up in the nose of the airplane as well back during the war. Um, so the more things change, the more they stay the same, I suppose, with some of these old older aircraft. Um, as we get started on the Q and A portion of tonight, uh, those of you who have questions, please enter them into the question window. I'll do my best to uh, pose them to Kermit this evening. Um, one thing I think that uh, is on everyone's mind, Kermit, is where does it rank on your sort of list of, of priorities to, to fly this airplane again? Oh, my gosh. Well, I tell you what, it isn't on my list to get anything going until I can get a successful business. And, uh, you know, this is going to be down the road because uh, I'm not going to try and operate it anytime before I can't put it down at the seaplane base. Like I said, if you're going to operate it, you have to operate it. You don't just, hey, let's get it flying, we'll fly it for a week, and then we'll take it out. You know, if you're going to operate it, you, you really need to have a plan to be a major focus, okay? So uh, it's going to be a while. I mean, I've just thrown off the top of my head. There's no way this thing's going to, I mean, it would be, I could see this thing not flying for uh, six, seven years, you know, we'll see, 10 years. By that time, I'm going to be pretty damn old. <laughs> the uh, When was the last time you flew it, Kermit? Oh, well, last time was uh, the 96 Olympic Games. And when, when I came back from that, from Miami, from the Dinner Key uh, uh, original Pan Am Clipper base, landed in the water, pulled it out. It's been sitting out ever since. And Kermit, I know you mentioned this earlier. Um, what is its total converted capacity to carry passengers? uh 36 i think and when i was up there at oshkosh uh every time i flew out and during the air show we give, would give rides to people i remember having a, a big group of the wasp the women's air force service pilots on board and it was a it was a pretty pretty cool deal to share with people i had one time uh i got tom pobresny uh, who was the president of the uh uh eaa at the time and got him in the right seat he got to fly you know when we were doing flybys in the air show and it was interesting the first uh, time I saw the Howard Hughes airplane was at Oshkosh. And, you know, I remembered back in, it was either 1994 or 1995, I remember seeing that airplane and I got a chance to go through it. I made a mental note and I thought, oh my God, one day I would love to end up with that airplane. <laughs> Lo and behold, it's in Florida. Kermit, do you have a sense of the uh, sort of maximum sea state from the manual of what kinds of waves uh, a Sunderland can reasonably handle on landing? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, I mean, I never had the opportunity to do it, but I mean, you could, you know, I think this thing would probably take two or three feet and it'd be, you know, kind of bumpy or whatever. But what happens is if you're out in open ocean, it's not a function of dealing with waves, it's dealing with swells, okay? And so regardless of what the wind direction is, you always land in line with the swells. You could see that it would not be very good landing into the swells perpendicular to them. So regardless, even if you've got to make a crosswind landing, you want to land to where you're going on the long, uh, you know, in line with the swell. And the airplane might rock back and forth as a swell, you know, as you go in and out of the different swells. But, uh, you know, and so, and then and you would have to use the same uh, technique, you know, for taking off if for some reason you found yourself taking off in really high seas. So I don't think the the, the waves and the chop and that stuff is is the issue. It's, it's swells, it's uh, swell, ocean swells. I've got another question here. Kermit, are there any flying boats out there that you would like to have the opportunity to fly or amphibious airplanes that you haven't yet had the opportunity? Oh, man, I tell you, um, if other than the Mars, you know, I've, I've flown that. I can't really 
think of. I mean, I've I've flown a PVY, I've flown an Albatross, uh, you know, flown the Ducks, and you know, I mean, I think I own them all. Other than the Mars, I own them all, Keegan. <laughs> that uh, that's that's a heck of a way to respond to that question. <laughs> um, we've got a question here from one of our museum volunteers, Kermit. When will you get your mosquito flying again so we can do some formation stuff with our mosquito? Do some formation stuff. Um, you know, the airplane is at Oshkosh, uh, and I took it there. The last time it flew was during the show in 1989, and the intent was was to bring it back, uh, uh, you know, because there were some air shows that I had scheduled, some military air shows after Oshkosh. So I flew home on the airlines, and it was about that time the Kuwaiti war broke out or something. And all of a sudden, all the air shows got canceled. It sat up there for a year. Something else came up, blah, blah, blah. Hurricane Andrew hit in 1992, okay? And we were distracted, so the airplane needs a lot of work. Ultimately, that airplane is gonna be disassembled and brought back down here and completely gone through. You gotta realize, that's all original wood. Every other mosquito on the planet is brand new. I'm not saying they're home built, but you know, ours is a completely original airplane. <laughs> so that's the, you know, it's gonna be a complete uh but and, you know, with as many air it's gonna be a complete restoration. We will de-skin at least the top of the wing and the top of the horizontal stabilizer. I think the 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 you know the fuselage is probably still good and stuff, but you really gotta take a look at it. It's I mean, how how long ago was the war? Seventy years. I mean, it, it's that the glue and the stuff is that old, and so you know, I've kind of been there, done that, and uh, for a long time, I was the only person flying a mosquito, last person on the planet, and uh, so anyway, uh, we'll see. There's other ones flying, and I think they're awesome. The people that worked on the ones I've seen, Jerry's, that is a piece of art. It is phenomenal what they recreated. I know Paul Allen's got one, uh, 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 you know, um, Rod, Rod, Lewis. Rod Lewis, yeah, Rod Lewis has got one going, and they're phenomenal, they're, they're gorgeous, it's a great airplane, I'm glad other people got them going, you know, I appreciate people, uh, all my aviation enthusiasts out there uh, would love to tell me how to spend my money, but uh, I'm going to figure it out myself, and some of these things, I've kind of been there, done that, and once somebody else has got something flying, um you know i'm kind of on to other things you know so we'll see another great answer um of all of the airplanes in your collection kermit which is your most favorite well you know what you're asking me is what's my favorite child they're all my children and so what's your favorite kid now if you change the question and said if you could only keep one airplane, what would it be? Uh, I, at this point, even though I haven't flown it, I'd, got, I'd probably say the Howard Hughes is S43, you know, because of the historic value, the uniqueness of it, you know. But I gotta tell you, if somebody said, you know, you could only keep one for fun and you couldn't have, you didn't need a crew, and you could stick it in a small hangar and you could push it in and out yourself. I got to tell you, man, that's the course S-39, that, my little giraffe airplane. That is my go-to fun airplane. I land in the water, I go places, I fly around, I buzz everybody. I can get in and out of the hangar myself. You know, it's it, it, I love that airplane. Right now, that's a very, very good favorite. Um, but if I could only keep one in the long run, and it didn't matter size and operating crew, you know, the Howard Hughes airplane's gotta be right at the top of the list. Excellent. Well, folks, uh, this is going to conclude our Q&A session for this evening. Kermit, thank you so much for spending your evening with us and sharing these incredible, well, I guess they're sea stories of, uh, of an incredibly historic flying boat. And uh, I know we're all eager to, to come visit once we have an opportunity to do so and the coronavirus has abated. We'd similarly all love to host you up here at the museum anytime you'd like to pop by and uh, we'll see what we can do to get the lake extended so that... Uh, you know, you can bring a flying boat up to visit. Good, good, good. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate all you guys are doing. And and uh, and when am I supposed to get my check for this from Jerry? I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs>
Tell well, Gary and everybody I said hi. Thanks, Keegan. I will do that. Thank you so much, Kermit. Have a pleasant evening. The, everyone else, have a good evening.